child long ago My soul starts to linger It's home I know If you catch me daydreaming Now and forever Thoughts are carrying me along To that place It was probably a day like this back here in 1827. Snow in the air, winter, but it didn't cool the mood of celebration. Throngs of people came here to watch as Lord Dalhousie, who was then the Governor General, broke the ground for that long talked about scheme, the Rideau Canal. Its entrance was to be here at the intersection of the Rideau and the Ottawa River, and here too would be a town which would adopt the chief engineer's name. And so the whole story began. Engineers, laborers, red-coated surveyors, fortune seekers, all flocked here to share the swampland with the mosquitoes and the beavers. Well, Colonel By's barracks on the hill have changed somewhat since that time, but the service area, which was over there and became the hub of activity, really hasn't. dawn in the farmlands southeast of the nation's capital. Chores are well underway for Lucien Clairoux, today's schedule being much like any other from spring to December. Although his way of life is similar to market gardeners across the country, delivering their produce to the kitchen tables of urban centers, the people of this region have maintained a track record in this kind of activity for some 150 years. Lucien's daily trek brings him here to the sidewalks within the shadow of the Peace Tower, a place called the Byward Market. The customers for the garden produce of today's vendors are predominantly the population of public servants and others, of course, who make up the cities of Ottawa and neighboring Hull. The original consumers, back in the 1800s, were canal workers and British military. Goods of the day could be delivered to the shops and stalls by boat back then, as this once cedar swamp area contained the bywash, a small channel-like effort which was connected to the nearby main canal. The Clairoux's are one of some 300 outdoor stall merchants that take residence here six days a week throughout the season. Interestingly, the Clairou name is the surname of nearly two-thirds of the market gardeners selling in the Byward, not all of whom are directly related. The atmosphere along York, George, and William Streets is flavored with Ottawa Valley dialect, sprinkled with political jargon, a stew of linguistic delight. In this earthy heartland are scribbled the footnotes of a country and its capital city coming of age. Michael Newton has catalogued events of the colorful past. Michael, tell me how this Byward market began. Well, the Byward essentially began when Colonel By arrived here in 1827 and established the town of Bytown. Let me interrupt you for one second. Sure. 
we got the word byward yes. from a ward named after Colonel By. That's right. exactly it. Lieutenant Colonel John By, Royal Engineer, the uh, man responsible for the construction of the Rideau Canal. This ward was named after him. When Lord Dalhousie uh, met Colonel By uh, over in the village of Hull in 18, September 1827 uh, to give him his instructions on the construction of the canal, one of the mandates given to By was to lay out a town site on this side of the river. Dalhousie's instructions said not to sell them the land to the, uh, the new townspeople, but to rent them their lots. Well, that was, that was quite agreeable to, to these people as they came in because they were here to make a, a quick dollar. But as time went by, they realized that without ownership of the land, they didn't have a right to vote, and they didn't particularly feel inclined to build up any equity on their lots uh, when they had to pay rents for it. Mm -hmm. So by the mid-1840s, uh, this came to a head, and a, a, an act called the Vesting Act was passed, and people were allowed to purchase the lots they were living on. And so a lot of the rough and tumble down uh, buildings that they had originally erected here uh, came down and people started to build substantial stone buildings. Part of the outcome of that was the incorporation of the town of Bytown Town and uh, the erection of a, of, a, of a good market. So Colonel Bai established a town and where did it go from there? Overnight it had a population of roughly 6,000 people, mostly uh, Irish immigrants who were brought up from Montreal and Quebec City to work on the line of the Rideau. And they had to be housed and they had to be fed. Now, that immediately brought in merchants, and so you had Sussex Street, which is now known as Sussex Drive, develop as a commercial thoroughfare. Right off of there, you had, on George Street, uh, the first market area, mm -hmm. all of to be used to supply the families of the workers and to supply the workers on the line of the canal. The market is in an area traditionally known as Lower Town. It is ironic that the neighborhood has come full circle, regaining its glory as the favored district of the city. It was the early success and popularity of the place that spurred jealousy among others in Bai's village, an envious contempt that erupted in a stone-throwing, gun-fighting street battle one gloomy Monday in the mid-1800s. Ironic also was that Queen Victoria's representative in the colony got caught up in this rather uncivilized set of circumstances, and just when she was about to give it the royal nod as capital of the United Province of Canada. The upper town was English and Protestant. The lower town was Irish, French, and Roman Catholic. And most of the uh, commercial and institutional development of Bytown was taking place down here in the lower town. The upper townians mm -hmm. didn't like this too much. They were left mm -hmm. with basically nothing. On top of that, the, the politics of the Canadian assembly in Montreal, uh, particularly the politics of the Governor General at the time, Lord Elgin, were not particularly favorable to the Tories. And so the Tories, when they heard that Elgin was coming to uh, buy town uh, to look it over in 1849 as a potential uh, site for the capital, after the Tories had burned the Parliament building in Montreal, by mm -hmm. the way. Another story. <laughs> An another story, <laughs> indeed. But uh, anyway, the riot uh, that happened here in 1849 was essentially part of that political rivalry uh, on the national or provincial level and at a local level. And it took place right at the Bay Ward, and it ended up with one man being shot dead and quite a, quite a gun battle going on in behind the building here, uh, the area of the Bay Ward Market. I didn't think that sort of thing happened in Canada. I thought that was just Wyatt Earp kind of stuff. No, it did happen in Canada, and it happened here in Ottawa. Stony Monday marked a shift of events. Upper Town had a card up its sleeve that would give it a winning hand. Spilling from the valley by rail and river was the bounty of red and white pine, international currency. Napoleon's severance of Britain's supply of timber sparked it, and free trade with the U.S. fueled it. The boom was on. At the west end of Upper Town, the turbulent falls called La Chaudière became the hub of industry, Slab Town. A wave of lumber kings moved in, Bronson, Eddy, Burley, and the famed John Rodolphus Booth. J.R. was the original industrial mogul. 
His operation became one of the world's largest privately owned companies. It employed some 4,000 people during the cutting season. But what the mills were to Upper Town, the faraway lumbering camps were to Lower Town. One of the reasons for the prosperity of the Byward Market in the 19th century was that the counties directly south of uh, Ottawa, Prescott and Russell, were for many, many years the only completely cleared uh, counties uh, for farming in uh, Upper Canada. And the lumber, the lumbermen uh, needed a central depot in which to purchase their supplies. So supplies were brought in uh, from the counties to the south of us and the lumbermen would come here to buy all their supplies for the trains that would go up uh, at the beginning of winter up the Ottawa and up the Gatineau on the Quebec side uh, to the uh, big camps. And these were the folks from the big camps, men of the river and forest. Fireblood characters who lived by chance with fate awaiting every move. A job meant months of isolation in the shanties where by evening they'd make their own fun. Telling stories was a part of it, and the shipping crates stamped with the byword address reminded them of many a good one. Just wait, the spring freshets and the drive will get us downriver, back to the old place. The byword had uh, a lot of taverns, one on practically every corner, and sometimes uh, a lot of them in between. And the attendant houses of ill repute that went along with the town. Yeah, well, yes, yes, they, there were those elements as well here. There were forever women being brought up before the magistrate and ordered out of town and not to come back. So really, <laughs> they really... That sort of thing going on in Ottawa? I'm shocked. Well, indeed it did go on in Ottawa and it went on for a long time. Their clientele were basically these uh, lumber fellows who would come down in the springtime terrorized by town for a couple of weeks, blow all their money in the bars, and then they would get back on the raft and uh, head off to Quebec City, and there they would terrorize Quebec. <laughs> and we do have newspaper accounts of huge millies and uh, riots and fights just right down around the market area here, in which the constabulary had to come in and take these fellows out. Throughout the seasons of the Byward's ups and downs, the area has been consistent as a people place. It has seen a renaissance in recent years with attention focused on the value of such historic neighborhoods in the core of North American cities. Even in the hush of a February morning, the bell of the Lower Town Matriarch the Basilica Notre Dame, the oldest Catholic church in Ottawa, tolls for the future. As the market has evolved, so has the city along the Colonel's Canal, the Ice Kingdom capital. And this is King. From his point of view, the place is also for horses. John Cundall maintains his stable a block from Market Square. The Cundalls have been horse traders for more than three generations, an enterprise that's rooted in the soul of the byword. Uh, years ago, our family used to do snow plowing and snow removal with all done by horses, you know. Yeah. And we had the uh, garbage contract for the city of Ottawa in the 1917 and 1918. Yeah. And my we dad. You had, had a trail drive here, too. You used to bring the horses in on the train from the west and yeah. then uh, drive them down. Yeah. The railway We'd have uh, picked them up on the stock yards at the end of Wellington Street. And my grandfather used to go down with a buckboard, put a team of horses on it, and tie a couple of western horses behind it. And then we'd chase the rest down. My dad would be on a pony, and he'd herd them down up over the plaza. And, down right from the buildings and down onto the market into the stable yard here. And days used to be the wild west of... Yeah, the, the trail drive days of Ottawa. Yeah, them days are all <laughs> over now. How many horses would you have? 
Oh, he'd have maybe a hundred horses uh, all at, uh, in hand at all times, my grandfather and yeah. father, and he'd sell between 500 and 800 horses a year, I guess. Yeah. He used to have lots of good contracts, you know? Yeah. CIP and the dairies and the bread companies used to buy a lot of horses from us. And Did you always have them down here at the... We've been on the market. We've been down here for 45 years, and we've been on the market for, I guess, the last 75 years. Most of the work now would be uh, sort of entertainment, sleigh rides, yeah. that kind of stuff. It's more a hobby and we yeah. rides and parades, you know. Yeah. We got a little parades and carnivals for kids, you know. It, keeps the kid, it makes the kids happy because you don't see live animals in the town anymore, right? Yeah. So they're happy to see the horse and just go for a ride with it. Yeah. Buying and selling. The equation that has brought people together here for a century and a half. And the granddaddy of the sellers, Irving Rivers. We've been here now for, uh, I guess, 65 years on the market. You always sell the same kind of merchandise? No, actually, we grew up in the fruit business here on the market. Oh, I, I see. guess it was the easiest thing for people who came over from Europe and who didn't know the language. And my father used to, because he couldn't afford a horse, used to stand between the traces of a wagon and pull the wagon himself. We subsequently moved up the block this way. In about 1945, my late father and my brother bought a store on the corner here, a clothing store. I took over this store on this corner in 1950. Uh, went out of the fruit then and went into the clothing. I've been cornering the market. I use that as a <laughs> slogan for just about 38 years. Well, I don't think you could tell if this place was ever painted because there's no wall showing. There's shoe boxes over there, and there's jackets and more shoe boxes up there. And that's the window and some stuff against the wall over there. A little bit of paint showing on the ceiling. Well, we painted the store <laughs> once. And when, we did, <laughs> when we painted the store, it was when we went into the second portion. We took everything that we had in the store and put it into the basement. There was no problem painting the store. Subsequently, we um, have filled up the store with merchandise and if you look above your head, you'll see that we've used the air rights. We only had shelves that were about six feet from the, from the ceiling, and we were wasting space, so we put up another shelf, so now we can go right to the ceiling. Don't waste any space. Well, I can see that that's been painted at some point up there. 1957, I think. I expect... <laughs> 57. If you'd like to come in, I, I'll give you a contract to paint the store. No, I expect if I come back in two years, that ceiling will be covered too. Well, Not we hang, paint, but we hang merchandise some... wherever we can, yeah. <laughs> you think there's a couple spaces missing, eh? Yeah, I'm just wondering what, whether you need some more stock. A contract to paint the store. Well, now, let me think about that. The history, the pictures, the stories, the sounds. For Spider Merritt and Bonhomme, the byword is a stage. Hey, Bonhomme, voulez-vous danser? La Bastogne, la Bastogne. Hey, Bonhomme, voulez-vous danser? La Bastogne, come on, say. being a street musician? Well, it's a <laughs> new thing every day, a new audience every day, you know. How it's long have you like been doing it? Ten years. Ten years? You must have been one of the first. No, the I, first? I, yeah, well, I followed in the footsteps of another uh, good Ottawa musician, Sneezy Waters. Is, uh, is that right? Yeah, I played in the market a lot. Play before. together? Yes, we have played together. Yeah. What kind of music do you play? Mm, well, they call it like the home sweet good home old time, now. yeah, good old time music. I guess yeah. I'd call it. You got the name Spider and you got the spider on the end of the banjo. Where does the name Spider come from? My daddy uh, called me Spider. Well, in fact, we called him Pop. And he calls me uh, Spider, always has. Uh, I was an immature walker and I used to crawl a lot. Oh. And so when I <laughs> crawled into the room, they'd say, Here comes the Spider. Yeah. Up over the furniture. And <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, can, go. What do you do? Do you do you find a street corner, like a corner of the market? Yeah, every corner I've tried. Some work and <laughs> some don't. I know the ones that work. Yeah. It's the three points of business. Uh, first one is location, and the second, second one is location, location, and the third one is location. So mm -hmm. uh, that's it. We've, we've developed a few locations in the market that work. The reason they work is because people can gather on these corners. You've been, a, uh, you've been on the street for 10 years. You're just going to keep going? Well, people ask me that. Uh, I always want to be able to come and play on the street, no matter where I go. Uh, I think that uh, Frank Sinatra should go out and sing on the street. I think anybody that's made it owes it to their public to go out and appear at them sometimes and still show that they've got their stuff. The thing about the street is that nobody is expecting anything, and, and therefore they're not preconditioned to uh, how to react to it. Uh, you know, if you're going to go to a, a club and spend a lot of money, well, you, you're going to have a good time. Yeah. You know, you better have a good time. And, uh, all, but when they go to the street, you can get someone who, who just may not be um, in a happy mood, and you can change that mood. Come along with me, and soon we shall be strolling through the market on a sunny afternoon. I'll sing a happy song for everyone there's room. Dance with me and please enjoy this market melody. Sing a song of sunny days, all those clouds will fly away. Children's smiles are enough to have Bonham study stuff. For the Clarouse, the melody of another market. And as for the canal builders, shanty men, political mandarins, and everyday people, a place of the heart. The Byward Market story is a continuing one. The face of it changes, sometimes just street to street. For instance, here, the trendy shops, the restaurants, the antique stores. Over there, not much has changed in recent years. Saunders Fruitland, the Byward Bargain Center, and further down, Irving Rivers Corner Store. But it is the stables, the market gardeners, the old Chateau Lafayette. I expect they are what keep the market honest in touch with his past. I also expect if old Colonel By were looking down right now, he'd be smiling. It'll always be home.